Hello everybody, welcome to Talk About House Untaught. I'm Juana. Okay, so today we're gonna to do a video um, talking about the differences between the housing crash that we had 2008 and today. Um, there's, the reason we're doing this, two reasons. First of all, I can see from the comments, there's a lot of people who still are regurgitating random stuff that isn't true, trying to make it you know, the reason why uh, housing might crash or whatever. And then um, the other reason is because actually things have substantially changed, meaning the baseline how housing works has changed substantially from a long time ago, meaning even 15 years ago, like substantially changed. We're gonna, we've got a bunch of slides where we're gonna talk about this. Um, one other thing, there's something different visually that you might notice. Um, so if you notice anything different, anything at all, just put it in the comments, and then at the end of the video, we'll say what what was different. Okay, so we're gonna what we're gonna do is we've got these charts we're gonna go through, and we're gonna talk about all the these um, the different things. Let's start with uh, lending practices. Okay. I'll put the chart up. Okay, mm -hmm. this is historical data from the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. Now, what this indicates is a high number on here is how easy it is to get a loan. Literally. So if it's a thousand, that means you you could just say I want a loan and they give it to you. Okay, you could see at the peak of the housing bubble it was eight sixty seven or eight sixty eight. It was literally anybody could get a loan. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about that really quick because it caused two things to happen. So you're a let's say you're a you you work at the casino and you just walk around and make change for people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you make. $3,000 a month doing that. Okay. Okay. This is in 2005. You go to a lender and say, hey, I make three grand a month. I was thinking about buying, because a friend of mine bought a, a house, a brand new house. And then when it closed, they flipped it. They just sold it and made $80,000. Mm -hmm. i would like to buy five of those. Is that possible? Sign here, press hard. There are lots of copies. Okay. <laughs> what was it, What were those loans called? So they were called, um, some of them were stated income loans. Stated, it, you didn't have to prove income. You literally had to just state what your income was. Right. You just had to say, oh, this is my income. Right. So there were all kinds of loan products out no, there. No doc, no right. documentation. Yes. You didn't even have to prove you actually had a job. You just had to say, yeah, I want to buy five houses. Right. So okay. the, the joke was that uh, you did not have to fog up a mirror, but it was helpful. <laughs> okay. Now... How is that a problem? Now, so the mortgage industry behind it was making, people were making money doing this. They, the originators were making money originating loans, so they didn't care. Uh, the mortgage companies were selling these in the secondary market, so they didn't care. And this sent a false signal to new home builders. What was the false signal to new home builders? So new home builders believed that there was this uh, outsized demand so they built lots and lots of homes as quickly as they could. Not only that, but this was back in a time when people would literally camp out uh, in front of the sales office. And then there would be lotteries of who would get the five or seven lots that would be available that day. Uh, they would do price increases with every release and the, each release had you know five, seven, 10 homes. So there was this whole, um, to say that it was frothy is an understatement. It, it was just this crazy thing going on. Uh, it, it was almost like, almost like a run on the bank. <laughs> okay. And that has been solved because immediately after that, first of all, the sec, those were, the, those were the, um, subprime. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were subprime loans. They all got wiped out. All the subprime lenders disappeared almost right. immediately. Lending standards got much tighter almost overnight, as you can see from the graph. Yes. Okay. Okay. Today, so it, when people say loans, they didn't mean interest rates. It wasn't interest rates that crashed the housing market because interest rates 15 years prior to the housing crash were 12% and 10 years prior to that were 18%. Mm -hmm. So high interest rates don't crash housing or anything. Right. And then remember, these people would purchase these homes and a lot of times they would over leverage them. So that means that they would um, 
that the loan would be for 100% or 125% of the value. So these people had no money of their own into the property, right? So that when things got hard, it was easy for them to walk away. There was an anecdotal story. One day I got four listings mm -hmm. from Wells Fargo. All of them had the same buyer name. And I got surprised when I saw this. This is unusual. So I went back and I went to the tax record and looked, put that buyer name in. And they had over 40 houses they had purchased. Mm -hmm. And I found out later that what they had done is they were mortgage lenders too. And uh, they were real estate agents too. So what they had done is they had went and done these 125% loans saying, hey, we're going to buy this house and fix it up. So let's say that the house was 400000 so they would get a loan, they would buy the house, they would write an offer for 400000 but they would get a loan for 500000 mm -hmm. They would take the 100000 put it in their pocket. And then the other, then what they would do is they would um, just let the house go. They would never make a payment, they never put tenant in it. A lot of these homes I, were, I was getting were brand new. Matter of fact, one of them I remember I went in uh, and after it was rekeyed, and it was a new construction and the little instruction guy for the thermostat was still like no one had ever been in the house. It right. was a brand new home and they were just, so that crazy lending caused fake amount of massive building mm -hmm. that had to be resolved. Right. And you know what uh, the result, one of the results of that was that there were lots of builders that uh, went out of business. So those people are no longer in business. Those people are no longer building homes. And then the builders that remained were uh, all of a sudden got religion and got very conservative. And so now they're afraid to build uh, anything that they see as excess. I mean, they, they just feel like if a home isn't sold before they break ground, they're not going to break ground. Uh, the, the largest lender in the country back then in an average year, mm -hmm. built 46,000 houses a year. The largest lender in 2000, or the lar I'm sorry, the largest home builder mm -hmm. in 2000, let's call it four, five, six, 40, 46,000 was about the average wow. for the largest, right? KB Home, who's now the largest, last year, 13,000. They built 13,000 homes. The level of building is substantially less, like mm -hmm. substantially less. Right. Um, okay, the next slide is the foreclosures. Uh, these are, as you can see this, the numbers, we did a whole video on this, the, the number of foreclosures, 2007, 2010. Um, it actually took a couple more years to get all the foreclosed properties all sold because the banks just didn't have enough. You know, the banks would have to hire the attorney firms to do the paperwork for the foreclosures, then they have to evictions, all that. They have to hire agents. And I remember one of the banks that I worked with, they had a limit. And what would happen is if we sold a house, like if my limit for that bank was 20, if we sold the house the next morning, as soon as it closed and we put it in the computer, the next morning we got a new assignment mm -hmm. to, to fill it up. So every time we sold the house, we got a, a new listing the next day. And um, I remember it, you had 200 Fannie Mae's, that was your mm -hmm. cap, right? Two, yeah. For Fannie Mae, it was 200. So if you had three closings one day, the next morning you would wake up with three more, right? Correct. And these were all foreclosures and bank foreclosures. Right. How about today? You were direct Fannie, direct Freddie, worked with a bunch of banks. Mm -hmm. what, how many REO assignments did you get from them last year? Zero. <laughs> yeah. There's actually, believe it or not, I'm seeing the, ooh, there's REO again, but this REO is not at necessarily bank foreclosures. What it is is some of the institutional investors are selling their non-performing assets, meaning stuff that doesn't get as much rent as they hoped it would. So they're just kind of selling those things, but then they're distributing in the same way they did REO. So people are trying to say, oh, the foreclosures are back, but they're, and they're fully accounted for in the MLS. Correct. Correct. Okay. Foreclosures, not likely, and there is no shadow inventory. So foreclosures are unlikely. We've talked about this before, partly because most people have equity, 40% of homes out there are free and clear, uh, it's like 72% of people have uh, loans under 4%. So there are lots of reasons why foreclosures are unlikely. And that doesn't mean that there aren't any foreclosures. It just means that there are very few, not enough to in any way impact the market. Okay. This next slide, annual average month supply of homes for sale. Now, 
is you a, a normal market is about five or six, eight, 10, nine. Those are bad. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was actually more in Vegas and Phoenix, Phoenix and Vegas, where we had 26,000 homes on the market at the peak mm-hmm. in all, in the whole MLS in Vegas. Okay. As you look over to the right and you see the last, you know, 2019 was the closest thing we had to normal market about 3.4 right now. Um, the thing that's a, that I'm noticing is all the people trying to compare 2021 and 2022 to today, they'll say, but Todd, the number of sales are only 43% of last year. Mm-hmm. Why is that not really super relevant? Because we had unique circumstances. Okay. Uh, you no, know, the unique circumstances were COVID. Um, people saw it as an existential threat. They they made choices that uh, were different. They were out of uh, out of the, the, their regular pattern. Uh, we had extremely low interest rates. Uh, we had the Fed on the horizon about to raise rates, and so people jumped in to catch the last in- interest rate train. So there were lots of things going on. Um, you know, the government pumped a bunch of money in the, into the economy. Uh, people had been, you know, living at home in their pajamas for over a year, so they had uh, saved up a bunch of money. So they had money to go out and buy houses. So there were lots and lots of diff- different things that caused a lot of transactions for those couple of years. And now we're getting back to a more normal market. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is because so many transactions took place in those couple of years, that actually sucked up some of the transactions that would have happened you know, this year and maybe next year. So that's part of it. The other part is that with interest rates having risen, now the sellers uh, that would maybe be move-up buyers are not really willing to give up those uh, sub-3% interest rates, particularly in an environment where the inventory is lacking, so they don't have that many choices. Um, And they really are rather enamored with their low monthly payment and they're and they are thinking that maybe they're going to wait this out that they're sitting in a nice home they're okay and they're going to wait until the inventory improves and maybe the interest rates improve too okay uh the next slide is total u.s homeowner equity this is in trillions of dollars mm-hmm. back when the housing bubble burst it was about 1.3 trillion you can see it dropped down below one there's $3 trillion of equity. How did all this equity come about? Because home prices are not triple what they were at the peak, right? right. That the, from peak to peak, peak last time to now they're not triple. But why is there so much equity? What happened in the meantime? So a couple of different things. First of all, um, be, when prices dropped, Lots of people purchased um, homes cash. Now, they purchased homes cash for two reasons. One, because homes were less expensive. And two, because they had done strategic foreclosures, which meant that they had gone sometimes years without making any mortgage payments, and they had saved that money so that when they did eventually get foreclosed or they did eventually do a short sale, they were able to go, go out and buy other properties cash. So you've got kind of those things going on, plus investors also buy properties cash, which is why, you know, we have more homes than ever that are free and clear. We've talked about this before, that we have about 40% of the homes out there are free and clear. So that's part of the reason why there's so much home equity. The other reason is because lending practices changed. So when lending practices changed, people had to come in with more down payment. So these 125% loan to ratio loans were gone. So now people had to come in with 10, 20% down. And so that meant that there was automatically built in equity when when people closed on the house. And then of course, over time, homes appreciated. And that meant more equity. Not to mention that as people make mortgage payments, of course, that principal balance reduces and the equity grows. The number of... Okay, so we have a 6.5 million shortage of homes, meaning there were more households created than homes built. So we have a net, we don't have enough homes. Homes have never been more efficiently used Mm -hmm. than ever today. The vacancy rate is less than 1%. 
And this right. doesn't mean you went on vacation, your house is, is vacant, or you have a second home or whatever. Vacancy rate for homes is less than 1%. It's the lowest ever because homes are now this super valuable asset that can just generate money because right. of rents. Right. Yeah, so the vacancy rates being low and the homes being utilized also lets you know that the um, the homeowners or the investors that own these properties see them uh, as something valuable, as something to care for, and it is less likely that they will be foreclosed because they're being utilized either as a residence or as an investment that generates income. Um, we have never ever said on any video, you should buy a house now. Home prices will be more in a year. We've never, never ever said that. Uh, we did say last spring when everyone else was calling for the 40 to 50% almost immediate drop in home prices, right? 40 to 50% that home prices would moderate. They would probably drop five to 10% through the fall. Mm -hmm. And then after the fall, they would just go back and do their normal thing where they kind of go up and go down. Um, we've, you know, the only thing we've ever said is I, I believe in five years, homes will be more than they are today. Right. In 10 years, I'm almost certain of it. I mean, there's almost nothing that would make me believe unless some builder shows up, figures out how to build a house for nothing, and then zoning laws allow them to stick it anywhere, um, that there will not be a huge demand for housing moving forward. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a huge demand for housing. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a bunch of people who don't have to sell. I keep people keep coming in the comments and using the words forced to sell. But Todd, as soon as the recession hits, so first it was interest rates and that didn't do anything. And then it was the builders, but the builders actually sold all their homes. Only 30%, 7% of all homes they actually had to do a price reduction on mm -hmm. to sell them. Um, all the rest of the homes are already in the MLS, so they're already, already accounted for. Uh, so I keep hearing the, for, as soon as the recession, okay, so let's do this scenario, Wanda. Mm -hmm. I have a job and a recession hits. Mm -hmm. Now, in a recession, usually, in a big, bad recession, unemployment goes up a couple percent. Mm -hmm. So two or three of every hundred people maybe lose their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, some of those are renters. Mm -hmm. So they don't get foreclosed, right? They're not forced to sell. They can't sell their renters. 40% well, of Americans are tenants. So they're okay. not going to negative, be, be, they're not going to have an effect on, on housing in that way. Okay, let's talk about the small people that are homeowners. Imagine this, you bought a house four years ago. Your payment's $1,200. Mm -hmm. You come home and say, I got, I got laid off today. They told me I, they don't think they can bring me back for a, a year. So I'm a year off without pay. I'm going to have to go find a job at, you know, at Walmart or something, right? And our payment now, our house payment now, we can't afford because it's $1,200 and it's a mortgage. So we're forced to sell and then we'll go rent. We could rent a house like this for about $2,200. So now we're forced to sell so we can go pay $2,200 a month in rent. So a couple of things to keep in mind. One, uh, obviously economically it wouldn't make sense to go out and rent for more than what you're paying in a mortgage. So that, that, that part's covered. Yep. But the second part is that you are much more likely to be able to do some sort of a loan modification with your lender than you are a rent modification with your landlord. Because <sighs> your landlord can go ahead and evict you and then you're going to have to figure it out. But your mortgage, uh, your mortgage lender is much more likely to say, hey, you know, you've got, let's say for the sake of argument, 20 years left on this mortgage. Let's go ahead and add another 10 years to it. And then that brings your payment down and it makes it more manageable. So, uh, you know, there are other ways to deal with it, particularly, you know, somebody who uh, reaches out to their lender early in the process and, and tries to work with them. Now, that's not to say that every lender is going to work with you. Of course not. And I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting that there are ways to, to mitigate this. Um, as far as um, force to sell, well, you know, that, that could be a possibility. You know, if you lost your job in one market and, you're, and you found a job in another market, yes, you may be forced to sell because you're moving to another market and and you need the money so you can buy in that market. Okay, I'll give you that. But that force to sell is not a fire sale. Okay, it is simply a sale. And we need we need more sales. That's part of the problem. So when somebody says, Todd, 
you don't understand. The number of home sales is down. Guess what? If nobody decided to put their house on the market, there would be zero sales. And people go, it's going to crash now. Oh, really? So when one house comes on the market, it would crash the market? It, if, if there were zero houses on the market and a single house came on the market, it would probably sell for double. Right. That'd be, people would be descending on it like locusts. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty crazy. Um, there is no shadow inventory. There is no, you know, millions of vacant homes. There is no millions of new homes that the builders have built and are just waiting to crash the market. Uh, there's no millions of for homes that have already been foreclosed. We've done that. We've done these videos. The, the national foreclosure numbers are public numbers. They right. don't. You so, can't secretly foreclose. Right. So you can actually go. Um, the post office keeps track of vacant homes. So that's a good way if you're interested. Um, you can go on their website and, and you can search and you can search by zip code and, and, and they'll tell you how many vacant homes there are. And you'll be able to see you know, if, how many vacant homes there are in your zip code. So that, that, that's a cool way for you to figure that out. So when somebody says that there are lots of vacant homes, you know, um, I would say, I wouldn't argue with them. I would say, look it up. Yeah. And vacant homes don't crash the housing market. No. Vacant homes have nothing to do with crashing the um crashing the housing market, but the housing market crashes when there are more sellers than buyers. And that's not what we have right now. Yeah, we definitely don't. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to keep watching this. Um, it'll be interesting a year from now. Mm -hmm. It's highly likely because of right now we have a very low amount of uh, people buying because there's less and less inventory mm -hmm. that will have more sales next year. Right. Very likely. I predict <laughs> right now that a year from now somebody will put in the comments but Todd home sales are still down 23% from 2021 or two they'll still keep talking about that one year the hottest year ever in real estate where home values went up 40% in a couple markets I think Boise and Miami were the blue blowouts right they home mm -hmm. prices just went up ridiculously right you can't use that as a baseline I don't care what Redfin says Redfin is just uh, Redfin. I mean, go on. Red, put your hat home in there and look at what Redfin says. It's it doesn't know. Redfin's guessing. Okay, uh, they're just grabbing generic data, and um, you know, whatever. We have very accurate information that we use to make decisions about what to do. Uh, we had if, if we thought housing market was was gonna would have crashed. If we actually thought it, we would have told every one of our investors to sell the house, your portfolio of homes. And we would be way retired yes. right now. Our self-interest. A lot of people making the vid crash videos, I know for a fact, because I talked to one agent, are getting leads from people and then getting referral fees to other agents to sell the properties. And I know there's going to be a bunch of people a year from now. They're going to be very upset that they dropped their home and have been in a rental for a couple years. They're going to be extremely upset. I'm glad that's not me. So, um, Anecdotally, I had a conversation with somebody earlier in the week, and um, he sold his house for um, nine hundred and some odd thousand dollars in twenty nineteen. Oh, that was a mistake. And um, that's when the housing crash video started. And um, that house today is worth um, about double. <laughs> okay, is it listed in the MLS? It's not listed in the MLS. Um, and the buyer is on a really long va European vacation because, you know, why not? The house doubled in value. <laughs> and he did, he, the house doubled in value. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And, and what was interesting to me is that this particular person is very knowledgeable, extremely knowledgeable about real estate. Um, and yet he chose to sell the house in 2019. What's funny is a lot of the crashers, I know for a fact, never sold their primary residence and have not sold their investment houses, mm -hmm. despite advocating that the people should sell so that they could earn a commission. And we could do that. We, sh I mean, how do it doesn't benefit us by just talking about what's going on in the housing market. We make our money when we sell a house. And if we don't sell your house, we don't make any money. Right. So, but we're not going to, we're not going to say something we don't believe is true. So far, we've been pretty accurate. I think we've pretty much, you know, we, we were right about the housing crash and getting in 
with the banks back in 2006, mm -hmm. which was well before any, no other agents were interested in, no other agents knew what an REO was in 2006. And we were aggressively pursuing that. Um, we were right in calling the bottom. You can go back to my 2009 and 10 videos where we called the bottom of the housing market. And we were ridiculed for that. Uh, no, there's still 15% more to go. They're, I'm like, well, I'm seeing inventory disappear. And when home prices are going up in October, November, that's unusual. And that's what happened. Home prices started ticking up. And we, I could see it in the data. The home prices were going up and inventory is disappearing. Um, that was around the time we set the record on one of our listings, 125 offers on a single <laughs> listing. It was listed for 95000 sold for like one seventeen. Uh, and I think most of, most of the offers we got were cash off, cash offers. Um, I think the only thing we miss guessed was that we didn't think home prices would go up. I think the, the, our big assessment was we, you know, with all the demand that home prices could go up like 12 to 15%, and they went up 22%, mm -hmm. which, so we under guessed on that. Um, we're not here to guess on, you know, no one knows what home prices are going to do in the next three or four months. They're probably going to keep going up, but guess what? They're probably going to start doing in the summer and the fall. They're going to go down. They do it every year. Every <laughs> single year they do it. So um, that's kind of a normal thing. So, right. yeah. So look, what we do is we look at data, we look at charts, we share them with you and we share our thoughts. If this is interesting to you, uh, fantastic. Please like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, <laughs> oh. share the video, uh, leave us a love note and tell us what you think and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.